right, take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 16. I'd be fine with hearing Brother Saxton sing all morning, but the Lord has a text for us. In fact, this is a new year, and we're talking about a new theme for the year for our church, and it's an important one. So Happy New Year to you. Every new year brings with it the hope for great things taking place. We start this year, those of us who call ourselves Christians should start this year with a great deal of hope. We should start with a great deal of anticipation. We should not approach the year with uh, the idea or the expectation of bad things to happen. The life will bring them. That'll happen. But we need not to be thinking that way. We should be thinking upwardly. We should be thinking with a great deal of excitement and hope because our God is the God of hope. This year could be the year that your loved one calls upon the name of the Lord to save them. Amen. Don't forget that. You've been praying maybe for your parents or your siblings or your friends for years. Well, this could be the year that they finally call upon the name of the Lord and all the angels will rejoice with us. This could be the year that your marriage finally gets traction and takes off. You may have been stuck in a marriage that's been very unfulfilling and you've been asking God to fix it or to repair it or restore it. Well, this could be that year. Go into this year with excitement of the possibilities. This could be the year that you get victory over your besetting sin. This could be the year that you experience reconciliation with your sister or your brother, your father, your mother, your son or daughter. Someone that you haven't had a good relationship for a long time and you've been praying about it. This could be the year. You have no idea what's, what awaits you. You can only hope and pray that good things await you. How about parents, those of you who have adult children, who you raised to be serving God, and they are not doing that. They're walking away from the Lord. They're not walking with the Lord. You've been praying, God, bring them home. This could be the year. Amen. This could be the year. This could be the year that your job search comes to a close or your financial woes come to an end. This could be the year that your teenager hits their spiritual afterburners and starts reading the Bible and starts to find out that the God of their fathers is a God worth serving. This could be the year that you finally get some peace in your soul. A lot of people suffering today. People who know they're suffering, but they don't want to admit it. People who know they're suffering and don't know how to fix it. This could be the year that God gives you peace. This could be the year that the joy of the Lord returns to be your strength. Now, I'm especially excited about what the Lord has in store for this church in 2019. I'm excited for Carl. In just a short time, we're going to see Carl walking with two knees. He's getting two knees replaced. Tin Man, he's going to have some oil on those knees. I'm excited for Debbie Becker. Debbie Becker's going to have a hip replaced in February. Right, I'm excited for Dave Rest. He's going to get that heart ready to go for Israel in October. I'm excited for my father. Amen. This could be the year. Amen. This could be the year. And there are a lot of people who are suffering different illnesses, and you've been suffering for a long time, and maybe this morning you've been hopeless for a long time about ever getting relief. Don't lose hope. This could be the year. You just don't know what's going to pop up through a doctor or through a person or through a connection or, hey, God may just heal you this year. You just don't know. I'm excited for this church because in October, Lord willing, 26 of us will be going to Israel. I'm excited for what happens to those of you who go. It will change your life. I'm excited about in July, we're going to take a missions trip to Trinidad. And whoever ends up going to that trip, I'm excited about what God will do in your life. I'm excited about different events that we're going to be doing. One in April in particular, a Passover Seder Supper. I think it's going to be good for our church and good for people that attend. I'm hoping to see lives changed this year, souls saved this year, converts baptized this year. People discipled this year. I'm excited about marriages being strengthened. I'm excited about friendships being formed. Believers discovering and exercising their spiritual gifts. I'm excited about leaders being developed from within and, and people rising to the occasion. Amen. Me too. You're just so special. You know, <laughs> you know we don't know what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Now, I... I do anticipate saying goodbye to some people this year. You say, who are they? I have no idea. But every year we're always shocked, aren't we? 
Next year will look different because we'll be missing some faces. But also next year, God will bring new faces. Faces that we have no idea what God is doing now, but we're going to find out that their life was about to be derailed only to, only to get put on track because they get saved or because they find this church and get the truth or because the Lord leads them here and they sit under the teaching and preaching of God's word. Or We just don't know. But I'm excited about what the year will bring us. And Lord willing, this year is the year of our church building being expanded. Lord willing, we don't know what's going to happen for sure, but that's our intent. And I'm excited about what this church can experience through that process. I'm more excited uh, about the congregation expanding their faith than I am the building expanding its size. Let me remind you, three years ago, I began praying about the future of the facility here because we were seeing sustained growth, and I was concerned that if we waited too long to start thinking and praying and discussing it, that it would be a mistake. Statistically, you don't want to wait till things are too tight to be discussing that. And so I prayed as to whether or not to bring it up to the church leadership. And on May 2nd of 2016, God spoke to me out of the book of Haggai and said it's time to move forward. And so we established a team of 12, a vision team. And over the past two and a half years, we worked hard to come up with some solutions, some proposals to our space problems. And I watched God work over the course of two and a half years. I saw resistance to moving forward for good reasons, but I saw the Lord open the eyes of people, open the minds of people to follow the Lord's leading. And back this past summer, I saw God take 12 men and put them in unanimous agreement to move forward. And then we saw a church body vote unanimously to move forward. And then we saw a town board vote unanimously for this church to move forward. And that was not the case two years ago. But I've seen God work. I've seen God move. And to me, that's the most exciting thing because when God is moving, that means he has a plan for us. And when he has a plan for us, that means good things are in place for us. Only he knows what 2019 holds for this church. But we are moving forward with the intent to add on to this building. And when we do that, we have to look at Matthew 16, 18 as our church theme for the entire year. We're going to read Matthew 16. We're going to start in verse 13. And I want you to note where Jesus is. It says in verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. Now, the coast of Caesarea Philippi is not the sandy beaches of some continent or some, some location or country. The coast simply means the borders. So Jesus came into the borders of a city called Caesarea Philippi. It's about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. It would be, we think, the furthest north Jesus would ever take his disciples. It would be the place we believe to be Mount Transfiguration or where Jesus revealed his glory to his three closest disciples. You say, why is the picture up behind me? The picture up behind me is a picture of a site in Caesarea Philippi. It's a site that we will see in October, Lord willing. It is the site of one of the largest springs feeding the Jordan River, or at least used to. And for that reason, it made this site very attractive for, relig for religious worship. Back in the Hellenistic period and also in the Roman period, this became a very popular site for pagan worship. In fact, those of you who will go there, you will see all kinds of intricate carvings on the walls. They would come here and worship, in particular, the god of Pan. You say, who's Pan? Pan is that half goat, half human with a flute. Pan is the god of fear, hence panic. And what they would do is they would come to this place behind me, which is a massive rock, and you can see a hollowed out cave in the middle there. That's where that spring fed. And it looked like it was a bottomless pit because of the spring. And they called that cave the Gates of Hades. This massive rock in Caesarea Philippi used to worship idols. And in that cave, the cave of Hades. That's where the god Pan lived. It was frightening. It was mysterious. And they would offer human sacrifices. They would actually drop people from the cliff as these women would fall into that water, if blood rised up to the surface, then they would say, Pan took her. Terrible things that would happen back then. 
But this is Caesarea Philippi where Jesus is speaking. We don't know if he's exactly at that location when he's about to speak, but I only show it to you because what we're about to read, I want you to consider the very good possibility that he was using this visual to set the stage for a tremendous announcement. Let's read it. Verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias or Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? He wanted them, before they answered about what their opinion was of him, he wanted them to acknowledge that no one else was seeing Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He wanted them to verbalize out loud, yeah, everyone sees you, Christ, as, you know, John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or some other prophet, but no one sees you as the Christ. And it's a very important distinction because in verse 16, Simon speaks up, which was his nature, because he was special, and, and Simon Peter answered and said, look what he says. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. No one else said that. No one else believed that. But Peter says, we know that you're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. That's Simon, the son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. What, what Jesus say, says there is, all right, guys, who, do, who does everyone think I am? Jeremiah, Elijah, John the Baptist, or some prophet. All right, all right, who do you think I am? Well, you're the Christ. Ah, Peter, no one's told you that, right? Flesh and blood hasn't revealed it to you. You didn't learn this in class somewhere? Uh, the latest uh, news reporter didn't tell you, right? Right? No one told you that? That means God the Father showed that to you. Meaning you guys have learned something that no one else has learned. You guys are discovering something that no one else discovers. You're the first to see in me that I'm the Son of the living God. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. Very important moment in the history of Christ's ministry because he is acknowledging for the first time publicly he is the Christ. And he's doing it in Caesarea Philippi, a place of high idolatry, a place where they would offer human sacrifices. So verse 18, based on that, he then says this, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, we can't say for sure where Christ was. We don't have any footage. We don't have any video or, or photo that would tell us he was right there. But it's interesting, isn't it? The Hellenistic period, the Roman period, preceded Christ. They would have been offering human sacrifices and, and, and worshiping this God of fear for a long time. And Jesus chooses Caesarea Philippi to say, Hey, I'm the Messiah, boys. I'm the Christ. I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build it on this rock. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, they won't prevail against it. Exciting stuff. Now, this verse, verse 18, is one of the most controversial verses in the Bible. But regardless of the controversy in the Bible, it is one of the most powerful statements Christ ever made. Every statement he made was truth. Every statement he made was profound. But this one, this one for a pastor, this one for a local church, this one for any Christian is incredibly powerful. Jesus says yes I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. I am the Son of the living God. And from here on forth, they would go forward. The disciples, the twelve, would go forward knowing, yeah, any doubts we had, they're put to bed. This man that we're serving, he is the anointed one. He will bring in the kingdom. He will establish global dominance. He will bring us peace. And he will save us from our political our political problems. And we're going to look at three things in this passage that need to guide us in 2019 as a church. Now, I realize what Jesus said there applies to a much broader church than this church. I understand that. 
I understand that when he says right here, I'm going to build my church, he's talking about building the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile in one body, globally, underneath the headship of Jesus Christ. I understand that. However, I think it's incredibly appropriate to apply it to 981 Bowen Road here in Elmo, New York. I think it makes a lot of sense to apply it to who we are and what we're about to do when it comes to building. And I want to look, number one, at the foundation of a building project, a foundation of this church's building project. But for that, we have to consider the controversy of this verse. In verse 18, again, he says to Peter that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. We know the foundation is this rock what Jesus is saying. What we don't know and what has been debated for centuries and what continues to be debated is what is that rock? What is he referring to? Many people, especially in our circles, believe that Jesus was referring to himself. After all, David repeatedly said over and over, the Lord is my rock and my salvation. Peter himself, the apostle, would refer to Jesus Christ in 1 Peter 2 as the stone which the builders disallowed and he, Jesus, is made the head of the corner, or a cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. And so a lot of people say Jesus is saying, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Others say that when Jesus refers to this rock, he's referring to Peter. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter, people believe that because Peter's name in the Greek means rock. Cephas, which is the name Jesus gave Peter in John 1.42, is Arabic, and that means stone. And so people believe he was referring to Peter because Peter was the one who stood up and said, we believe you are the Son of God. We know that now, and we're willing to state that and stand by that claim. And many believe that Jesus is saying, well, because you have been given the revelation from God, that I will start with you. If you look in the text briefly, you'll notice also the wording of verse 19 will lend people to think that Peter is this foundation. When Jesus says, and I will give unto thee, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Then there are those who aren't sure that Jesus is talking about himself, and they don't like the idea that he's talking about Peter. So they say, well, when Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church, they think Jesus is referring to the confession that Peter made. The confession that Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And people believe that this confession, this doctrinal truth, this, this revelation is what God or Jesus was going to build the church upon. As I said, we can't know with absolute certainty what Jesus or who Jesus was referring to at that time. But for the sake of application and for the sake of unity, I believe we can all agree on what the foundation of the church is. For the sake of application and direction, I believe we can all agree on what Christ builds his church on. Whether it is him himself or Peter who was the one who said, Thou art the Christ, or on the, the confession of Peter, I think we can all agree that Jesus Christ was going to build his church on the foundation that he is the Son of the living God. I believe Jesus was saying, I am going to build my church on the supremacy of Jesus Christ. The church will start with me. The church will start with that I am the Christ. The church will start uh, founded on the fact that I am the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world. Whether Peter said it, Peter believed it, doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is, Jesus Christ being God is what the church is built upon. Christianity hinges on this fact. Do you understand that? This is the danger, and I'm in danger of getting off track here, but this is the danger of the modern church movement. The modern church movement is driven to reach the seeker, to reach the unchurched, to be able to attract those who might find us. That's a dangerous platform, a dangerous foundation to lay your church on. You know why? Because once you start tailoring to the lost community, you'll do what attracts them. Today that might be music that's appealing. Tomorrow that might be alcohol that tastes good. Next year it may be, you name it. You understand the problem with following the people. 
we're going to build the church, Jesus says, on one fact. What is that? That I'm it. That I was sent from heaven to die for the sins of mankind. That I am God. That I did create everything. That I will die for the sins of mankind, but only I can do it. The supremacy, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles. What was that foundation they laid? Hey, Jesus is the Messiah. Hey, everybody, Jesus Christ is the Christ. Hey, Jesus is not just the prophet. He's the anointed one. He's the son of God. What were the apostles doing? They were ambassadors of Christ. They were the first to tell the world that Jesus was the Messiah. That foundation was laid and Jesus would begin to build on that because that foundation is what the church is supposed to be all about. Because they saw what men didn't, because they learned what men didn't, because they realized what men didn't, they would be the foundation. You know what a cornerstone is, right? A cornerstone is just that which gives the foundation orientation. Jesus Christ gives the apostle orientation, but the apostleship, they were the ones that were starting the, the foundation of the church, and it was all about Jesus Christ, deity and royalty and preeminence. When all others saw Jesus as John the Baptist, they saw him as the son of the living God. They were the first to see and declare Jesus as the Christ. You can see in our text, look at verse 20. The text confirms this foundation, this revelation, this basis, when Jesus charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now ask yourself, and maybe you have as you read the Gospels, why would Jesus tell his disciples not to reveal that? That's why you came, Christ. Jesus, that's why you came. You came to save people. They're waiting for the Messiah. Tell them who you are. They'll follow you by the masses. They'll flock to you. No, don't tell anybody yet. Or did he want to keep it a secret? No, it wasn't time to start building it. And if that foundation were laid before all the other things were in place, the church would be ahead of schedule. So Christ said, hold off. Because once I gave you the green light on that, we are starting the building project. But don't tell anybody yet. That's the foundation. You say, what does this foundation have to do with, with Calvary Heights? If we're about to embark on a building project this year, church, we have to remember the foundation for our project. The concrete will be the foundation of the building. But the preeminence of Jesus Christ will be the foundation of our building project. Everything we are about to do, every penny we're about to spend, every second we're about to invest, every drop of sweat we're supposed to put into this, it will be built upon not the pastor's vision, not the, visions team, the vision team's recommendation, not the bank's approval. It should be built upon the preeminence, the supremacy, the deity, the royalty, the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has come to save sinners. We are not building this to give ourselves more room. We are not building this to give ourselves more seats. We're not building this to put a fellowship hall in the basement where we can eat. We are not building. We are not spending money. We are not spending time for us. We're doing it because the foundation is Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. And we need to let people know that He came to save their sins. Everything we're doing... It's because Jesus is the Christ. After all, if Jesus isn't the Christ, then why are we even here this morning? I hope you didn't forget that. I hope you didn't come this morning to church because this is what we do. we got to see each other and encourage each other. I hope you didn't think you came to church this morning because that's what we do. We have to avoid the pastor or, or avoid the preacher getting on us on Monday morning. I, I hope you came to church this morning because Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which means He is the Savior of all men, which means we get to know God because of Jesus. Amen. That's why we're here. Amen. That's why we worship. And that is why we are going to build by the grace and mercy and will of God. Amen. The foundation, 
The basis for our project will not be about Calvary Heights Baptist Church. It will be about Jesus Christ. We have to remember that at all times. Yes, we will put a name on our sign. Yes, we will move this sign back so people can see it. We will even put a steeple on the top of our church. But it is not to magnify the name of Calvary Heights. It is not to promote a single person in this building. It is to make sure that Jesus Christ can be uh, preached and taught to our community because he is the Son of God. Amen. Let us never forget that. Number two, let us look at the focus of our building project. And this is in the second part of verse 18. When Christ says that thou art Peter... And upon this rock, I will build my church. I love this. Th this phrase, I will build my church, has brought me tremendous comfort over the past three years. It's brought me great comfort and relief over the past few years of praying about what to do with our facilities. Now, Peter was just told something that a lot of people disagree he was being told, but I believe he was just told something very powerful. I believe Jesus said, hey, you're Peter. Remember, Peter said, you're Christ. I hope you see this irony, this phrase. Thou art the Christ. Thou art Peter. You're the son of the living God. You're the son of Barjona. You see this parallel going on? There's a special connection, special relationship. Jesus is equipping Peter to do something very important, very special. So Peter, you know Peter. Peter's like, yeah, I'll get out of the boat. I'll stop you from going to the cross. I'll be everything for you. And I love it because he's probably like, oh, man, I am special. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jesus says, yeah, but I will build my church. Praise him. Amen. He didn't say you're going to build my church. And he didn't say you're going to build your church. He said, I'll build my church. You see, Jesus Christ was about to purchase the church, wasn't he? He was about to sign that deed. He signed that title. He was going to use his blood. Acts 20, 28. He has purchased the church with his own blood. Amen. It's my church, Jesus says. Amen. Not yours, Peter. I may use you to pour some concrete at the foundation, but it's all about me. And we have to remember, moving forward this year, the boss of the project the one in charge of the project? It ain't that goofy lead pastor. It ain't that, that, that other guy either. It ain't that team of men. It ain't the architect. It ain't the engineer. It isn't the general contractor. The boss of this project, he's a Jewish carpenter. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one that calls the shots around here. You know why? Because it's his church. A lot of people will say to, say to me or other people, well, your church, your church. Uh, I go there. But it's Christ's church. This is one of the most comforting phrases for a pastor in the Bible when he says, I will build my church. Because when people come to me and say, well, well you have to do this or you have to do that. It ain't mine. Jesus will do what he wants. I just get to kind of watch the sheep. I don't own the flock. I don't even own the, the fold. I just get to hang out and pull a sheep in here, slap a sheep there, rub a sheep here, make sure some sheep know they're special because they stand out. <laughs> you understand? This isn't Pastor Cable's project. This isn't even your project. This is Jesus' project. Now, look in the text because right after... Jesus says to the disciples, hey, don't tell anybody yet that I'm the Christ. Look what he says in verse 21. Remember the context of building his church. From that time forth, from the time he revealed his, his true identity, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. You know, he just revealed the plans on how to build the church. He just unrolled the architectural drawings. I will build my church. The picture of the, of the crucifixion. Well, what's this, Jesus? That's how I'm going to build my church. 
unconventional. You know how Jesus would build this church? As the song goes, with two pieces of wood and three nails. Jesus Christ wouldn't hire contractors, he'd hire Roman guards. Jesus Christ wouldn't hire the, the greatest skilled carpenter in the land, he'd hire, he would hire cruel and evil and self-centered priests and scribes. And he would say to the guards, beat me. He would tell the guards, spit me. He would tell the Roman soldiers, crucify me. Why? Because I will build my church. Jesus Christ would build his church with his own literal sweat, blood, and tears. This is his building project. He's in charge. And he'll do it however he wants. But he always uses people. And he always uses the sacrifices of people. As we proceed this year, let us recognize that it is God's project and it is his decision to use whomever, however, whenever he uses to use them. God will employ people. He will task the leadership of this church to play a major role in the project, but he will absolutely task the congregation of the church to play a major role in the project. Look throughout the Bible, from the tabernacle in the, in the wilderness to the temple in the promised land to the reconstruction of Jerusalem and the temple, there were always sacrifices on the backs of the people. You say, why? Is God tough and rough and likes to make the people suffer? No, he wants the people to take ownership in it. Amen. Must them take ownership in it. God will ask you. God will call you. God will move you to take a part in his building project. But it will be his call. Not the pastor's call. He will give you funds and ask you to donate them. He will give you skills and ask you to use them. He will give you virtues and ask you to exercise them. But remember, the boss is Jesus. He's in charge because he said, I will build my church. Let's move on very quickly to the third point. And that we see in the final phrase of this verse. Jesus says to Peter that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What a victorious statement. And I've got to believe he was right there at that rock in Caesarea Philippi, pointing at that, that hollowed out cave that everyone knew lives would be lost and there was great fear because of the God pan that was being served there. And I've got to think he brought them there to say, hey, this place that represents all of evil, this place that everyone's scared of, this place that everyone's worried about, that place and everything it represents will not prevail against my building. On, I will build it. It will be able to sustain any attack that Satan throws at it, any attack that the gates of Hades or gates of hell bring at it. I will prevail. It's a great statement. It's a victorious statement. It gives the, the apostles some, some excitement and confidence, but I don't want you to lose sight of what he also told them. Or maybe I should say what he didn't tell them. You know what he didn't say? He didn't say, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not even open to it. He didn't say, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't dare fight it. Come on, preacher. No, he said the gates of hell won't prevail Amen. against it, meaning well, they will try. Last week we talked about Bethel. Remember that message in Jacob? He was in Bethel. He took a pillow and laid down and had this dream. Remember, there's this ladder that reached from heaven to earth and angels ascended and descended. Jacob woke up from his prayer and was terrified and said, this is none other than the gate of heaven. You see, there's a gate between heaven and earth where angels descend and ascend and they are ministering uh, servants of the Lord. And there's another place called the gates of hell where there are not angels but demons ascending and descending from hell to earth, from hell to earth. When God created all things, he created angels, he created people, he created characters, and to all of us he's given this tremendous gift called free will. We can do what we want. Sadly, we do often what we shouldn't do, and we are in the mess that we're in the world today because of that. But you know, angels also made a mistake Angels use their free will to rebel against God. It's incredible that they would do that in the presence of God, but they did. And now we have a host of fallen angels that we know are now demons. And you say, well, why doesn't, why doesn't Christ just stop it all and not allow us to have any conflict and just finish them off? 
Well, he's given them a free will. They can fight as much as they want. But this much is true, Jesus said. They'll fight, but they won't prevail. They'll fight, but they won't win. As long as I'm building, as long as I'm the architect, as long as I'm in charge, I'm going to build this thing so good that no matter what they fire at the walls, it won't break them. No, no matter what they put in the roof, it won't hurt it. I am going to build a church that can withstand the strength of hell. And we today, we are in a spiritual battle. It is a battle that is taking place over the souls of men. And it is a battle that really uh, focuses on the church. You see, the church is referred to by Paul as the pillar and ground of the truth. And only the truth, John tells us, John 8 tells us, can make people free. That's right. And so all of hell focuses its attention on the church because if it can stop the church, if it can silence the church, then the truth won't proceed. And by the way, they're succeeding in many ways. Come on. Because now we have a modern church that doesn't preach the truth because it may offend somebody. Recently, I talked to somebody who goes to a growing church, and, and they were here visiting, and they heard me preach, I think, on abortion. It was just a brief clip of abortion. And when I got done, this person asked me, well, was that uncomfortable for you to do? And maybe I'm ignorant, but I said, no, because the Bible's pretty clear on that. And I'm not a big fan of killing unborn children. I understand there are any number of tough situations that lead to that, but I'm okay with saying taking an unborn child's life is wrong because I believe that's truth. Now, if you've, if you've had an abortion, there is an absolute place for forgiveness there. Amen. And God can help you through that and get you through that because God will help us with all of our mistakes and all of our sins. But anyways, I preached on abortion, and this person said, was that hard for you? And I said... Not really, because that's my job, is to preach the truth. I have to be gracious and compassionate, but no. I said, why do you ask? Well, because my pastor would never do that. And I said, why wouldn't, I understand, why wouldn't he preach against abortion? Well, because he wouldn't want to offend somebody that may be there. And I think motives are pure. He doesn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I get that. So I asked the next question, and I wish I didn't. I said, how does he preach the gospel? Because the gospel starts with, you have to acknowledge sin separates you and God. The answer was heartbreaking. He doesn't. I said, then how do you get people saved? Well, if we get them in a church, the hope is they'll stick around long enough and eventually we'll be able to talk to them one-on-one -on -one about it. We are the pillar and ground of the truth. Satan doesn't need to close our doors. He just needs to stop us from preaching the truth. When Christ builds his church, he builds it, the foundation is truth. And from there, you can reach the lost. Not vice versa. But Christ says, I'll build my church and hell won't prevail against it. Look in the passage. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but the passage just fits together like a glove naturally it's the word of God and in verse 22 Peter's going to prove the point Jesus just made that there is a spiritual battle going on directly from the gates of hell verse 22 Peter takes Christ and began to rebuke him saying be it far from thee Lord this shall not be unto thee you're not going to go to Jerusalem and die you're the Messiah you're the Christ you're not going to let scribes push you around you're not going to let rulers push you around there's no way you're going to die Peter forgot the whole resurrection part, but it's not going to happen. Look what Jesus says to him. Verse 23, but he turned, Jesus did, and man, this must have been tough to hear, and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. If Peter thought he was something a few verses earlier, he just, <laughs> he just had a sit down moment, all right? He was special for all the wrong reasons here, you know? Why did, do you think Jesus called Peter Satan? No. Or was Jesus speaking to somebody else? That's right. Amen. Thank you. you know what's going to happen if we start building? Because we have made a decision to place the pulpit at the center of our building project, where the Bible is preached unapologetically, where the truth is given unashamedly,
where we believe that the truth of God's word can save souls and change lives. You know what happens if we start expanding the walls and opening the doors and trying to reach more people? The gates of hell will open and we will hear the rumble of soldiers from hell who will turn to this church and try to harm us, to try to destroy us and try to stop us because the truth of God's word will be preached. But people, if we're not careful, we will say things and do things that are irreverent to Christ. We will say things and do things that will bring harm to the body of Christ. We will say things and do things by the influence of evil spirits and by the temptation of Satan that could jeopardize the work of God here. And what we have to remember is when that happens, we will be wise to follow the example of Christ. And instead of saying, I can't believe so-and-so would do that, I can't believe so-and-so would say that, we will be wise to take a step back and say, wait a minute. There's something more going on here. Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Instead of focusing on the people who make mistakes, let's focus on the spiritual battle going on behind that. Amen. Now more than ever, we must read our Bibles daily and consistently. We must pray Amen. fervently. Now more than ever, we've got to be close to the Lord. We've got to love each other fervently and passionately now more than ever we have to recognize that all of hell will move against us and we defeat hell by being full of grace and being full of truth by being full of light and by being full of love we must stand strong together and recognize this battle is god's we cannot afford at any moment to fight each other you say why why would we ever do that trust me satan's chief way of ruining a church is starting right on the inside. And it may be over something ridiculous like the color of the carpet. We would never do that, preacher. <laughs> Look in Baptist church history. Amen, there's a reason there's a Baptist church in every corner down south. <laughs> you know what we can't afford to do? We can't give Satan any place in this church. Any place. You say, well, right now we've got to be minded to work. No, we have to be minded to love one another. Work. Now more than ever, we have to be minded to stay close, to stay true, to be prayerful, and be ready for the attacks that will come. They will come. They will come. God has a plan for this place. And when he's the builder, it will prevail. We must follow him. I, I wrote in my notes a phrase that I probably will repeat over and over this coming year. The phrase is this, Christ's hammer always attracts Satan's sword. When Christ starts to wield the hammer, Satan will move to yield and wield the sword. We must be ready for the gates of hell to fight. I want to finish with verse 24. Before I read it, know that Christ is the builder. He is in charge. He is the boss. But he's looking for volunteers. Verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In many ways, I've been relieved because this project is not mine. There's a lot of pressure with the amount of money that we're considering. There's a lot of pressure with the amount of work and logistical hurdles we're considering. But I love the fact that it's not my problem. Amen. It's Christ's problem. But here's the thing. He can handle it, but he's looking, for, he's looking for volunteers. If any man will come after me, he's looking for volunteers. But the volunteer work he's looking for is not with hammers, screwdrivers, and paintbrushes. He's looking for people to take up their cross, deny themselves, and follow him. You say, where is he going? Don't worry about it. He's the boss. All right, I'll follow you. Just tell me where we're heading. No, just take up your cross. Deny yourself. Follow me. If we do that, if this congregation is a congregation of people, not with a hammer, uh, not with a paintbrush, but with a cross on our back, and we just follow Christ through this thing, ain't nothing stopping this church. The sky is the limit for this church if we are going to be selfless, self-denying, Christ-honoring, Christ-following, loving Christians that just say, wherever you lead us, Lord, we'll go. There are going to be bumps in the road. I hope you understand that. There will be problems in the future. We have to be ready to follow Christ wherever he leads and let him have the preeminence from start to finish 
of whatever God has for us. You know, God may shut this thing down. If tomorrow God said we're not moving forward, you know, we, you know what we have to say is? Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Because we're just following you. Let's remember this year, Jesus said, I will build my church. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.